Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us today. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program, and our first person today is Mr. David Bayer, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible through the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation and the Helena Rubinstein Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. First Person is a series of weekly conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serve as volunteers here at this museum. Our program will continue twice weekly through the middle of August. The museum's website at www.ushmm.org provides information about each of our upcoming first person guests. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater when we are finished today. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of David Bayer's biography so that you can remember and share his testimony when you leave here today. David will share with us his first person of account of his experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor over the next hour. When he is done, we are going to um, invite you to come and chat with him when we're done so that you might ask him some questions after the program is finished. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from David is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with his introduction. And we begin with this 1945 portrait of David Bayer taken in his hometown after liberation. On this map of Europe, the arrow points to Poland where David was born September 27th, 1922. He will be 94 this coming September. On this map of Poland, the arrow points to the approximate location of Kosciuszko, David's hometown. And here we have a contemporary photograph of David's home in Kosciuszko. David's brother, Joshua, is in this 1938 photo of a Zionist youth group. He is in the third row, third from the left. In 1939, German troops invaded Poland, starting the Second World War. The next year, the Bayers were forced to move into the Kosciuszko ghetto. Here we see a view of the Kosciuszko ghetto through the barbed wire fence that enclosed it. In September 1942, the ghetto was liquidated and its inhabitants, including members of David's family, were deported to the Treblinka Killing Center in the arrow points to the location of Treblinka. David was taken to Pianki, an industrial complex that produced munitions. In 1944, he was deported to Auschwitz, and the second arrow points to Auschwitz. Here we see a fence around the barracks in the main camp of Auschwitz I. As the Soviet army neared, David and the other prisoners were sent on a death march. However, David managed to escape into the forest and was found by the Soviets. He spent two years in the foreign-involved displaced persons camp in Germany. Here we have a map of the major displaced person camps um, and with the arrow pointing to the foreign-involved displaced persons camp. And in this photo, David, who is in the first row, the third from the left, and his friends pose at an airport near the displaced persons camp in 1946. And here we see David with a friend at the foreign-involved displaced persons camp in 1947. Later that year, David moved to Panama. We close with two photos from Panama. First, here is David in front of a gate to a synagogue in Panama City. And here we see David standing by his employer's horse in Panama City. After a remarkable year in Panama, David went to Israel as a soldier in Israel's war for independence. He saw a great deal of combat as the state of Israel was created. Eventually, David returned to Panama before coming to the United States to start a family and a new life. Today, David and his wife Adele live just outside of Washington, D.C. The Bayers have two children, daughter Sandra and son Mark, two grandchildren, and a great-grandson who was born in 2014. Their grandson Josh, who served in the Israeli army, is a civil engineer in Virginia. 
their granddaughter, Jennifer, who is the mother of David and Adele's great-grandson, is a recent graduate of the University of Kansas and now works on Maryland's eastern shore. David volunteers his time in the museum's registry on Wednesdays and often on other days. As part of the registry, David researches and compiles lists of those who survived the Holocaust as well as those who perished. Among other purposes, the registry helps make it possible for survivors, family members, and others to find those who may have survived. In addition to our first-person program, David speaks frequently about his Holocaust experience, such as to a group of Navy personnel who are assigned to the White House. He also speaks with groups of visitors at the museum, especially those who are Spanish-speaking, as David is fluent in Spanish. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mr. David Bayer. Yeah, thank you. Please, David, thank you. All right. Thank you so much for being willing to be our first person today. I know the lights are a little bright, but um, we'll, uh, we'll get started because you have so much to share with us that we can't possibly cover it in an hour, but we'll start. It was... I will talk fast, okay? You talk fast, okay. You, you, you always do that, so, so we still won't cover it all. It was less than a month before your 17th birthday when the Nazis invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. Before you tell us about your life during the Holocaust and the war, first, tell us a little bit about your family, your community, and about yourself in Koszenica before the war began. All right. Koszenica in Polish means nothing happened to the goat. Kozienice <laughs> means nothing happened to the goat. Because we had a lot of uh, wild go goats around our, our neighborhood, and a, a lot of big uh, kings and uh, prime ministers came there to hunt. So the, the one prime minister's wife yelled out, nothing happened to the goat, so they named the area <laughs> Koshenica. <laughs> My father had a shoe factory, and we had employed maybe 25 people all the time. And we made the sh shoes, all kind of shoes for, for wholesale sale, you know, for stores. My father used to go out of the country and sell it, taking orders and making the shoes. And I was only 13, 14, 15, till 16 years old. So the Germans came in, I went to school and uh, played soccer and had friends and, and lived in a nice house. We had a maid. My mother was taking care of the kids. I had two sisters and a brother. And my mother and father were only in, in the forties. David, how, how big was your extended family? A lot of my relatives? My father had four more brothers. Mm -hmm. My mother had three brothers and herself. In our family was maybe a hundred people, and I'm the only one survivor. My mother come from a different city called, called uh, Razin, a local for Razin. Uh, her grandparents, they all perished in the Holocaust. David, and uh, during, when the Germans came in... David, just a couple more questions before we turn to the Germans coming in. How big was Koshenica and how big was the Jewish population? The population was 8,000 Jews. 8,000 Jews. And maybe about 3,000 Christians. And, uh, and we lived across the, from my church, mm -hmm. across the, our, our beautiful church, and we had a big, big house, which is still there. And I, and I abandoned that house. When I came back, I have to put in all the applications and pay back taxes, and I didn't want to live in Poland anyway, so I give it up. <laughs> <laughs> David so, is, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, when the Germans came in, the first thing is they went in to plunder. We were not home, we were in the forest hiding because the, the, the German army were bombarding the area, and we were in the forest hiding. We were scared. When we came in, when the Germans already occupied the area, we find German officers and soldiers in, in, in our house, taking everything they can, 
dishes, uh, tablecloths, uh, blankets. But everybody could find leather, shoes. We had a, a, a shop in the back, with a warehouse with, with thousands of thousands of pairs of shoes. They, were ha they, were, they didn't ask no question, they just took it, everything. And my mother was standing and crying. And then, when we were there, a German came over to my father, and they said to him, why nobody likes the Jews? And my father was a tall, big man, with a little beard, and I was afraid, I was standing next to him. And my father made like a gesture with the, with, the, with the arm, because we don't hit back. We don't hit back. We never hit back. This, is, this was our problem all our lives. If we would have hit back, half of the Jewish population would have probably survived. We didn't hit back. God will help. And my mother was praying day and night, always praying to God. David, um, your mother, your family owned Passover dishes that were hundreds of years old. They were, they were antiques mm -hmm. from, from, from years. And we had, every year we took out the dishes for Passover and we, and we put it away in a, in, a, in a big case, a big plywood box. And it was in a shelf hidden. And the gentleman were plundering and plundering. They pulled it down and knocked down the box and a, a half of the dishes were broke broke down. And my mother was crying. Why did they have to do that? And they took the good ones out and they left the broken one. They had no shame, the Germans. It's like, it's coming to them. Everything they came in, they, 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 they took and, and, they, and, they were, and they were always right. Then, my mother was so scared that she didn't let us out of the house, but I sneaked out of the house. Every time to look for food because we, had, we couldn't, we had no food. The, the, the Germans cleaned out our potatoes, but we had everything what we had, they took it also. So I went to a place where a German uh, group of soldiers had a, a, a field kitchen they were cooking outside, and they were serving them food. And I took a little bucket with me, and I went there, and waited the Germans to give me leftover. I once talked to a school in Virginia, and it was a, a Catholic school. And I asked the priest if I could tell the story, but I'm just going to tell you. He said, tell him everything, don't be ashamed. There were boys standing there and waiting for the leftover soups the same way I was standing there. And they were not Jewish boys, they were Christian boys. And when they saw me, they were friends of mine, they went to school together with me, we played soccer together. They pointed their finger to the Germans that I am a Jew. They said, Jude, Jude. Some Germans came over and, and pulled the soup in my bucket. And some of them came over and threw it on the ground. And there were boys who I know since we were all, since, since childhood. We went to school together, we played together. Their fathers used to work for my father in the shop. And I asked the priest to tell, to, to tell the story. He said, tell him, because they have to, everybody has to know everything. And I asked him today the same question. Should I talk about that? And that's why I bring it up. David, how long was it before they created the ghetto in Koshinitsa and forced you and your family into the ghetto? It took about uh, six, seven months. Six or seven months. And we had to move out from our house. Leave everything, all the furniture, everything. We had nowhere to go. We went to one room. The Jewish community gave us a room and our first floor for our men who had a big apartment. And we didn't have no, I slept. In, a, in somebody else's house, a friend of mine asked me, he had more space, so I stay on the floor, and slept on the floor. My grandparents were staying in their own house because the house was in the ghetto, in the area where the Jewish people lived. And we had to move out. We, we still had some leather and some shoes hidden in, in our garden. 
her uh, cellar. So my sister, every once in a while, got a pair of shoes and get some stuff and went to a farm. And she put in a cross, a wooden cross, like a Christian. <clears throat> a few times she went and came back with food. But one time she, she never came back. She was 19 years old, about two years older than I was. She was a blonde, beautiful girl. And then the Germans caught her somehow. I don't know, maybe somebody snitched, we don't never know. And the ship there, September 27, 1942, to Treblinka with all the Jews together. I never saw my sister after that. Where was I? I was working on an irrigation canal six kilometers out of town, near the Vistula River, with other, but, but, but with other 500 people there. And we were digging the canals for the Germans. And then the German transfer me to a munition factory called Pionki in David, Poland. David, before you tell us about before that, that, before that, before you went on the irrigation ditch while you were still in the ghetto all the time, you used to sneak out too to get food. I went all the time, and I was, uh, I was caught standing in a bakery trying to get bread. There was a curfew. There was a lot of people who went standing in the bakery didn't have much bread. And the Germans came, got everybody from, from next to the bakery and locked us up in the, in the church across from my house. They took everybody, and my, my parents didn't know what happened to me. Only my little brother, he, in the morning he came out and I went to the fence from the church and I was trying to motion to my house and my brother saw me. And then they find out that I was locked up in, the, in that church. And then the Germans took everybody from that church and took us to a camp, it used to be a military camp in Radom, a big city in, in Poland. And I was locked up over there. It's like a, like a prisoner camp. But my sister came and bribed a guard and, the, and, and let me out. With money, she paid money. And I went home in a, in a horse and buggy. David, when, they, when, you, when you were sent to do the forced labor on the ir irrigation canal, I think that saved your life in some ways. That, 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 that's, what, that's, what, uh, uh, that's why I survived, because I worked for the Germans in a Bonnichi factory, then uh, in Auschwitz, then in Auschwitz they took me to, to, um, to a coal mine, and worked in the coal mine to the last minute. Mm -hmm. I was young, healthy, I was run away so many times, I was stealing bread. I was doing anything to survive. I, I was an uh, escape one from, from, from the camp in Pionki, and I got shot in my leg. And uh, three other guys got killed. And I was lying in the snow near the, the defense where the Germans caught, caught us, and, and I'm pretending that I'm dead. So they didn't bother me. I was lying with the dead people next to it. The people the, from the camp came and picked us up. So I, I, they realized that I'm alive, and they fixed my leg up, and I went back to work in about a month. David, I'm going to take you back just a little bit. When they liquidated the ghetto, um, you were able to go to Pianchi, as you told us, but you lost most of your family at that time. Everybody, right? I didn't. Nobody else. I, uh, after, well, I have to bring up this after the war. After the war, I came back and I went to the, the railroad station to, to find out whoever was a witness to saw my parents. And there was a boy who was selling coal. And he went to school with me. Mm -hmm. His name was Kujib, Felek Kujib was his name. And we went to school together, we were good friends. And he saw my mother, my father, my, my, my sisters, and my brother. And he told me that he waved to them, and, and he's still there but after the war. And as the only witness who saw my parents go on, on, a, on a wagon. In the wagon, they pulled in, pushed in 100 people. And there was no place to, to lie down, no place to st just stand up. Where you, where you, when a lot of people die standing up. Standing up. They, they, and they had disinfectant on the floor. You know? 
the, the Polish boy told me that he was he saw the whole thing. He he was selling coal before the war and, and during the war and after the war. And so your and your whole family went to Treblinka. They went to Treblinka time. and they gassed him in the same day. September 27, 1942. Which also was This your is birthday. my birthday. Your birthday. Same day my birthday. But David, you you were sent to Pianchi. Tell us um, you tell us the incident where you were handed luggage, which which was a, enabled you to be sent to Pianchi, so that you had something to carry. You remember telling me this? The Germans want luggage. The Germans took away everything from the people valuable, and they always looked for something valuable. They always thought that the Jews had a lot of money. I didn't have nothing. I, I had a few dollars. Which, which is in Polish lot, but it's nothing. Uh, one day, uh, when, I, when I went to, when I went to, uh, I, I have to jump because I, I, I don't remember a lot of times. Okay, where, okay. When I was when I was going to Auschwitz, I had to, uh, about maybe two or three hundred slotters, and, and the train stopped in a station, and this the stood there without water, without anything, and there was a a Polish. Uh, a guy who worked on a, on, on, on a locomotive, what is it called? Uh, machinist. Mach a machinist. Machinist. Mm -hmm. He put a horse from, the, from, the, from there to my to buy wagon. I throw out the money and give it to him. He pulled water in. Because he gave you a little water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So David, you're sent to Pianchi, which is your munitions factory, and you were made to do make gunpowder, that was very dangerous work, right? Pionki was a savior and also a, a disaster. Mm -hmm. a, a powder for bullets, pow explosive, is made out of cotton. The Germans didn't have no cotton no more. The Polish people, the government used to make it from, from cotton, it comes from Africa, from everywhere else. So the Germans made a, a imitation cotton, made out of paper. So they built a factory of, of, to make cotton. And then all the chemicals, and they taught me how to mix the chemicals with that cotton. And I worked on four centrifuges making that powder. This was every day uh, uh, close to that. The gases eat us up. The, the, a, a drop of, of, of chemicals made a hole in your shoes. You had to wear wooden shoes you know, and, and the clothing. Food, they didn't give us no butter, they didn't give us no, no meat, just plain soup and black bread. Plain soup and black bread every day. In the morning, just black water, called it coffee, made up of grain, burned grain made up, that's all. But Whoever was smoke, a smoker never made it over there. And there was a one young man from my hometown who he used to work for my father. He was the one who was putting the cotton on the conveyor. Okay. And the conveyor was coming to my apartment and I mixed the cotton with the, with the chemicals. With acid, sulfur, glycerin, nitroglycerin, all kind of chemicals. And I had to know exactly how much to do. They taught me how to do it, and if I made a mistake, I got punished. So what happened, this guy, the smoker, gave away his ration, gave away his bread for cigarettes. A lot of times, after work, I volunteered to clean up the, the, the club for the German soldier, but they were smoking and drinking and eating. Mm -hmm. And I found butts, cigarette butts, I, I gave it to him. What happened, he worked so many hours, that 12 hours a day, every day, that he fell asleep, the cigarettes fell on the conveyor, there was a fire. They announced, they beat up, took her to a bathroom, they beat her to, to death, naked. And then they announced that they're going to hang us. And everybody should come out to the plaza and prepare, there was a, a things already there, like a, a scaffold. Like a, no, it was a, like a, was a, a soccer gate, like a soccer gate. And they were hangers. But luckily, 
there was two Germans, one was named Dr. Lesche, we call them like this, and the other one was Dr. Witte. We never forget their names because I remember. They came and they begged the Gestapo, the Nazis, not to kill us because we need the production. We need the, the machinery that should keep on going because they have to train other people, we, they never make it. Mm -hmm. And luckily, they like, let us go. The previous people who did minor things, they hanged. But he argued you were so important to the production. Because I was the most, I was important because uh, there, there was one German young man, engineer. He never cost us, he never kicked us, he never beat us. He always was, hello, goodbye, thank you. Because we did a, a terrific job. And nonetheless, you tried to escape several times. So will you tell us about one of your escape attempts? There was a young man, uh, I call him young man because they were all younger than I was. His name is Moishe Matis. He was six feet tall, big eyes. He was the one who uh, connected the hoses from the, from the tankers to the building with the chemicals. Every time they came, he, he was working and put it in, in the building, in the building tanks. He told me, I have a way to escape. Let's go. There's the, the forest, there's underground armies, Polish underground, Russian underground. They're fighting the Germans. We join them. <coughs> I said, OK, let's go. We went out. We walked in the in forest, we walked in the villages. And then we came to an area where we saw big posters. Ten liters of vodka to bring in a Jew. Ten liters of vodka and, and, and ten pounds of sugar. Ten pounds of sugar and ten and liters of vodka. vodka. To bring in a escapee from Pianki. Mm -hmm. I turned around, Moshe Matis was walking. He saw a farmer. The farmer was not so friendly, so he also turned back. We went back to the camp, to the same area where we were out. David, we and I know you had other escape attempts. We could spend our whole hour just in all that happened in Pianki, but I do want you to talk about the locomotive fire. You were that was very important because of what happened to you. I had a supervisor, a police supervisor, which. I uh, sent him to my hometown, to Kozhenice. He was a civilian who worked in the factory before the war and during the war. So I sent him to, to, to my hometown to a Polish man who used to work for my father. And we hid a lot of stuff with him, clothing, my father's suits, uh, all kind of things from our house, furniture, uh, and I asked him with a letter to give him whatever he, to, he wants. Because this way the Polish, <coughs> uh, uh, he, was a, he was a supervisor. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, <coughs> could help me. So because I wanted to get out because the gases were eating me up. We had no mask, we had nothing. So he went and he got a few things from that Polish man who was, I was hiding stuff. And he tried to give me another job. What was the other job? To work in a locomotive to transfer the powder to another place where the, where the processes and, and they put it to, to rollers to make sheets and then they cut it. And I was not so experimented in a locomotive, a small one. It was a small locomotive going from one place to the other. And something happened, a spark and something, and a, and a fire blew up the whole locomotive, and my face and my arm got burned. I walked around like this. I couldn't walk anymore. I didn't go to work anymore. <coughs> so, and this was the time when the when the Germans were losing the war, it was 1944, losing the war with the Russian, 
in the Russian by advancing, the Germans were retreating, and also the Germans wanted to dismantle all machinery and the factories ship it to Germany. So then the, after, the, after all these things, the Germans took us and with me, with my, with my arms, my face, up the crust and uh, shipped to Auschwitz. And when I came to Auschwitz and got out the train and the Germans saw me with my arms like this and my face a, a big cross, he came over and asked me, what happened? I better go to the, to the crematorium right away. But there was a young man, a guy who was a, a prisoner. He said, if they ask you something, tell them that you are a chemist, that you are an expert making powder, explosive. And that's what I did. I told the German, I, I'm an expert. He took me aside. He took told, me him to you, a, told him you were a chemist, right? Yeah. yeah. A clinic, put cream, and it took a while, and it's all fall off, and I was clear. But they didn't send me to a to, uh, municipal park, they didn't send me to a coal mine. And I worked in the coal mine to the end of the war. And this was the worst place in the world. No food, and you have to produce 18 little wagons of coal every shift. And it's impossible. I couldn't, I couldn't the, the, the shovel alone weighs 10 kilo. I couldn't even lift it. I was skinny. I had no food. The soups they give us and the bread, that's all it couldn't produce so much coal. And it, the quota, what you had to produce, 18 wagons. 18 wagons. Bargains. We didn't do it. Wagons, yeah. you know, it was impossible to do it. So we cheated. We, every, every, every prisoner had a, 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 a number with a, with, a, a, with a tag. We had to hang up on the, on the, on the wagon the number. So we cheated. We took off the, the previous shift and we put ours. And that's why the German didn't have much call anyway. <laughs> David, I'm, I'm, they call this sabotage and they hanged a lot of people too. We're going to come back to the time in the coal mine. I'm gonna, let's go back to Auschwitz for a couple of moments. While you were in Auschwitz, you had surgery done on you, didn't you? This was with, when I was going to the coal mine. Okay, in the coal mine, okay. Actually, it was not Auschwitz anymore, it was Yavozhno, it was a sub camp of Auschwitz, and the mines were right there. And every morning when we had roll call, we stood up, and I guess stop and goes by, checked every one of them, and I had my, my glands swell up. And, and, and from, the, from the air, from the, from the coal dust, from the, from the malnutrition, so I was always trying to cover it up. This time, this Nazi came over and with a stick and checked it out. Hey, what's this? I had my, my glands up. They took me out. They took me to a clinic. I didn't go to work. Took me to the clinic and they operated on me. No anesthetic, no nothing. Zip, like a, with, a, with a knife, cut my throat right in here. And this is an experiment. And whoever get experimented never goes out alive. Even if even they fix you up, they saw you up, they do everything, and everything is fine. But they still send you to the crematorium because you don't want no people alive. After it. I was lucky, better lucky. Why? There was a, a nurse, a man, a young man from my hometown, which he recognized me. He was he was a a, a medical student, and they made him a nurse. He was a political prisoner. So what happened? He saw me. And, uh, and he lived a block and a half away from, from, from me in, in Poland. He said, Dovcha, Dovcha, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you. He called me Dovcha in Polish, is David. He said, I'll fix you. He made out some kind of false paper that I should go back to work. And I walked out from the clinic. Mm -hmm. The German showed me the paper. The, Went, went to my barrack and went to work to call my tied up here. Yeah. Still a big scar here. Yeah. After we finish, um, we're going to invite you to come and uh, talk to David afterwards. He has with him the, the Nazi records of the surgery that were found in what are known as the International Tracing Service archives that came to the museum several years ago. So in 2011, the records of that the surgery doctor, were found. The doctor, 
he made a report in, with my name, you know, this is a, a copy of the original, the German doctor. By the way, the, 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 the German doctor was hiding 20 years after the war in East Germany, and somebody snitched on him behind him, it was a trial, and they hanged him. This was about 10, 15 years ago. David, this, this go back to the coal mine, and, and you were telling us about, you figured out a way to um, uh, fool the Germans about the quota, but tell us about the overseer, the, the German overseer, and what happened to him. Well, i tell you about Reuben. And this, leads, tell, this tells us about Reuben, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, every once in a while in the mine, they have layers, coal, rock, and, and some clay, and then there's coal. And, and, the, and, and people who are hungry, looking for food. And a lot of them are hallucinating. They, they, they're going crazy, they don't know what they're doing. So they're taking out the, the, the clay from the wall and eating. And some of them died. Never made it. Goes to the stomach, like, like a pare. It's, it's like clay. And imagine that you're eating something. Also, there was a German supervisor a Nazi with a swastika and everything else. He walked around with a, with a walking stick and a copper handle, like a pick, pick handle. And this was his, his stick. And he went to check where to, where to drill, where not to drill. You know, he was a supervisor in a coal mine. He didn't like somebody or maybe he didn't work fast enough. He would go with him and zoom over the head. He killed a lot of people. And there, and they always bring somebody else to play the place to one who die. One day, they call a young man named Ruben from Poland, from Lodz, a religious Jewish boy, very religious, wise religious, constantly praying in, in, in Hebrew. And he recited the, the psalm. You know what the psalm is. In English, it is with a P, and they don't even mention the P. And I cannot, I always say psalm with a P. <laughs> psalm, I said it right this time. <laughs> and he was praying and praying all the time. After one day, he, he killed, this German killed a, a man in the mine. This, we had a police supervisor, also who, the one who was putting the dynamite in, he was yelling, fire in the hall. You know, he, he was the one in charge of the dynamite. And this Polish man was a Polish patriot. It was a nice guy. He told us one day, he said, when I will tell you to move away, pretend that, move away from me. Push the wagon away, try to walk somewhere else. Do it, don't ask questions. One day, this German, Nazi came with, with the walking stick, and uh, the Polish miner had already drilled, put in dynamite, and he didn't yell nothing, no uh, fire in the hole, Achtung, or watch out, or anything. The German was passing by, and he pushed the button and killed a German. Whole coal wall fall down on him and covered him up. Ruben, the one who was praying all the time, came over to me. Am I still crazy? Because we called him crazy. He was always praying. So we called him crazy. He said, didn't God help us? <laughs> and I, from, that, from then on till now, I, if somebody asks me, do you believe in God or what God to help? I always bring up Reuben. I don't deny and I don't admit. I, I'm uh, neutral, and that's what happened in the mine. In you're still working in the mines in January 1945 when the when the Nazis bring you all out of the coal mine and take you away from there on a forced march. Tell us what happened. We, the Russians were coming closer. Bombardment was going on. The Germans were running like 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 mouse. They were scared to death. Some Germans even took, put on uh, uniforms, uh, concentration camp uniform, and, and throw away the, 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 the military uniform to, 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 
to survive because the Russians were very, very fast and, and swift. They didn't pull around the Germans. So what happened? It took us out of May. We didn't even couldn't go even to our camp. And everybody had to hook up and, and keep marching towards Germany. We marched no stop. Snow, cold, no food. We had to work, uh, work on uh, in, uh, small highways and uh, country roads, because the main highway were tanks and, Russia and, and, and German soldiers running away. If you fall down, they shot you. No, no survivor. If you, if, if you fall down, you, you, you're dead. They kill you. They walked around with the, the guns and looked for anybody falling down. One time they pushed us into a barn, a big barn, and, and then somebody ignited our cigarettes or who knows what it was. It was a fire and we, we had not, a lot of people had no time to, to get out. David, this march that you were on... Um, and they marched all the way towards Germany. And, and it, was, it was one of the coldest winters in memory, bitter bad, cold. Bad, bad, bad. How did, you, how did you get food on the march? We're always moving, we're always moving. If you don't move, you, you die. And a lot of times I took off the clothes from that dead person and I asked him to forgive me. So many times happened. Because I put a one ticket out there, my shoes fall apart. I put a, a guy's shoes with wooden sole. It was, wasn't comfortable. I had a terrible, I had to wrap around and wrap with rags. We went to one camp, the other camp. Finally, they pushed us into a camp called Breicham in German already. We crossed the Polish border, we in Germany. And there were other people coming from all the directions, different kinds of prisoners, a lot of British soldiers over there, all kind of prisoners. In Bleichhammer was big warehouses, a lot of warehouses, so everybody was broken into the warehouse, got food, and I, I went in there, I couldn't get nothing anymore, only margarine. Ma there were stacks of margarine. I piled up margarine in my pants and my shirts all over my body, boxes of margarine. Tucked everywhere. And I, and I couldn't even walk anymore. <laughs> and then the barbed wire were not electrocuted anymore because the, the, all, the, all the power stations were knocked out. There was no bus. We, we could touch the barbed wire. So we, we digged underneath and, and, and we tried to escape. A lot of them got shot. But that moment when I was there, and the Russian soldiers were the prisoners also sneaked out and we went to the forest, the old forest. Ruben went with, with us. So Ruben is with you with when you got up. He okay. stick to with me like a, like a glue. <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 I believe in him, he, he's not crazy no more. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened, we went to, and he, he got something, all of a sudden he started complaining, he's bleeding and something because a lot of bombardment and he probably got hit without even feeling it because it was so cold that the cold didn't, didn't, we didn't feel anything. He said, I cannot walk no more. So we pushed him in on a barn, an empty barn with an abandoned, abandoned house, there was nobody there. And he, he pushed him in the barn and said, I stay here. And me and two Russian prisoners walked in deep in the forest. We couldn't walk anymore, we lie down, in the snow on the, pound, on the pine trees, and we ate the margarine, and the Russians were looking for. Before you finish that story, you said you ate the margarine. You said the margarine you told me uh, was melted over was your whole melted body. Melted from the, and, and I was dirty from the coma. I never took a bath, and, and, and we scratched the margarine from our body with the cold dust, with everything else, and we ate. But it was it was the best thing. And also, they were looking for. <laughs> For mushroom, mushroom You're looking roots. for mushrooms, okay. Because we were lying in the snow, the snow melted, and we find some mushroom and some, and then some, some bark from, from the small tree. It was five to six days 
lying there and we had not movement. We had bombardment, we had shooting, we had everything else, but we didn't move. Every, every once in a while, I, I was in the middle between two Russian people, we armed each other. We, and we changed, we exchanged. Then they decided we have to go out, we, we die, we're going to die here. So we, we walked, we walked, we come to our field. That's all I saw, skies and, and snow. And all of a sudden we saw trucks and, German, and Russian soldiers coming. And the, record, the Russian recognized the Russian soldiers. We didn't, I thought it was German. I was scared. And we walked towards them and a, a Russian soldier came and picked me up and carried me with one hand, like a sack of potatoes. I was, weighed maybe 60 kilos. You lost half your body weight. Well, was, bones. And uh, they took me into a, to a woman's house, a German woman's house with a daughter. And they told her to, in Russian and half German to, to take a bath, me bad, wash me and help me. And the German woman did. She was crying all the time. She was scared for her daughter. And the daughter was a young woman, maybe in her 20s, I don't know how old she was, but she looks like dirty, sloppy, so I said, why did she get a bat? He said, the Russian, the Russian. They were scared of the Russian. Every time the Russian come to the house, they saw me, they walked away. And the woman didn't want me to, to leave. And I stayed there maybe 10 days. I don't remember how long. She gave me clothes. And she, she cooked a lot of soups, mushroom soups and other kind of soups. I don't know. And uh, I recuperated a little bit, and I, and I said, I have to go. And I showed, she showed me the how the main highway how to go, and we walked uh, to Poland. You wanted to go back to Poland? I wanted to go back, maybe I'll find somebody, maybe, maybe, I, I don't know. And I went back to Poland, and I didn't, it's like a cemetery to me. So I made a U-turn after a few more days, and, uh, Went to Germany, went to uh, Czechoslovakia. While you were in Poland, David, you, um, you went back to, you had left some of the family belongings before you went into the ghetto with somebody who said he would take care of them. Take care, they wanted to kill me after that. Mm -hmm. When you came back to see if anything was left. I didn't take that, I, he gave me a one, uh, one thing, he, he said he gave the, the Polish supervisor a lot of stuff. So I said, okay, good, very nice. You, know, you have anything, I, I have no money, I want to go to somewhere else, I want to go to, to Germany, to, to France, to, to Europe, to get out of, of Eastern Europe. So he gave me a table. Uh, we had a, a table in Poland, they called it a rig table. Here it is, it's not, not new, in Poland when I was a kid, this was a new thing. You, uh, make the table longer and smaller with, with, with more legs. And this was a big sensation in our house because we had a big house with a big table. So I sold it and made some money. And then they made a party and I, and I didn't want to drink. All the Polish people were making a party. I, I don't remember the occasion, but uh, this, they, they, made, they said that for me, but I don't believe it. I realized that they wanted to knock me off and I should not came go, stay in Poland. So you turned around. So and I, I disappeared and I went to Germany and I went to, to in Paris and went to Holland and uh, in Belgium and all over Europe, and I and I went back to Poland with, with stuff who I robbed the Germans. Because when I went to Germany, I didn't go there for for, for pleasure. I went there to to get get money and, and, and make money and, and sell it on the black market and, and make money. And I, I made a lot of money. I made about maybe $10,000 in 1945, 46, 47. This was a fortune. And I spent everything in Paris. David, you, you, would, you would spend almost two years in, um, or good, almost two years in, in foreign in, vault. In Bleichen, and uh, in uh, foreign vault. In foreign vault. Eventually, though, in 1947, you went to Panama. How, what took you to Panama? Okay, I, I, 
I could have gone to the United States easily because the United States told me I'm a refugee, I have nobody, you, you could apply. But after, after being already a man and recuperate and money and everything else, I got, I got greedy. You know, money, money is a bad thing. You, you don't have it, it's, it's not good. You have it, it's not good. You have too much, it's not good either. So what happened? Germany was an a open society. American soldiers coming in with, with they didn't suffer. And the one who suffered already went back to the United States. And the one who had occupation were young people from the, from the South in very competition with, with me. Me and, and people like me. With who? With German women, German girls, and German black market things. Competition. And I got, well, I'm going to go to the United States. He, he hates my guts. He wanted to kill me. I'm, going, I'm not going to go there. I go to somewhere else. So uh, Panama came up. A friend of mine who went to school with me, his parents came before the war and took him to Panama. So they, they looked at our list and saw my name and said, they asked me if I wanted to go to Panama. So I said, okay, a good occasion. I go to Panama. So I went to Holland and got a ship to Curaçao. And from Curaçao, I went to to Colombia, Venezuela, and then Panama. And I didn't like Panama. Why I didn't like Panama? Panama was a good country, but I didn't like the Jewish people in Panama, period. They were, you, you, you lie. I wanted to talk about what happened in Europe. I wanted to talk about survivor. What do you, what do you, what do you want? You want, you want business? Here. Here, uh, here, merchandise, go be a peddler. Okay, okay, I, I'll be a peddler, I, I go to work. But I want to tell you what happens later, later. They play cards every night in a cup, in a busy, they only listen to me, what, what happened to me? So I went to live with the Indians. I went to a place called Concepcion, on the border from Panama, Costa Rica. And that's why I speak Spanish, and I, learned, and I lived there eight years. The best people in the world, the Panamanian. Humble, good Indian people. And I had a good life. You said but some of the best years of your life. My best eight years there are the best. Yeah. But I had, I actually, but I, I actually was a year in Panama, but I met the Indians. And, and I went to a town called David. Look at the map, look at the Panama, you find out the city. Concepcion, David, it used to be a base, a military American base there. And I met a Jewish guy from Germany. His name is Sam Sand. He was head guy sitting in a chair, finding himself hot like hell over there. And, and, and uh, he don't do nothing. All the Indians work in a five and ten store, a big store. When he saw me, well, actually what I was doing with the Indians, I was making leather in Concepcion, tannery, making leather. And they were making moccasins and shoes and selling to that guy. And when we came to see him, he said, oh, another crazy guy. What are you doing here? He, he, you, you, Israel is becoming independent. Why don't you join the Israeli army? He, he was nagging me. This was 1948. I listened to him. I went to Panama. There was a ship going to, to, to Palestine then. And I joined the Israeli army. When I came to Haifa, I was in the army. For well, a year and a half in the Israeli army, I went back to Panama. And, 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 and then I lived with the for eight years. But you got, before you continue, you have to tell us about your trip from Panama to Israel. <laughs> if I have to tell every detail, not every detail, you never get out of no, here. No, no, not not every. Just just a little, few more details. The ship was called Vasilyades Raf, R A F, Royal Air Force. Vasilyades was a Greek ship, and the owner from the ship named the ship after his son, who perished 
during the Second World War in England on an airplane. It was air the ship was commissioned by the Jewish agents of New York and they picked up sugar in Veracruz, Mexico, gasoline in, in Aruba, Curaçao, and then in Panama, a torpedo boat who two American soldiers stole from Miami, Miami, and the uh, torpedo boat was a German torpedo who America took to the United States. And the ship was named, the uh, torpedo was named Honduras, with four live torpedoes. Okay, and when, we, and I, when I come to Panama Canal, the ship was waiting there. And they picked up the torpedo boat. No, the torpedo boat was picked up in, in Cuba, in a place called Antia. So from Panama, I went to Antia, to Antia to Veracruz, and then across the Atlantic to And Cuba. you're towing the PT boat. And we towed the boat all the way to the, to the Gibraltar. And, and we had to go at night because the British were blockading the Gibraltar and they were signaling to stop. And the, and the Jewish agency told the captain, keep going. And he went, went to, the, to, Cana, to the Gibraltar and, went, and, and there was a storm on the Mediterranean. And what happened? Every once in a while we had to go to the, from the ship to the, to the torpedo to get the water out. And one day was a big, uh, before Greece, we got to a place called Sparta. And the ship was sinking. And we couldn't save it. And two, or the two guys went down there with hatchet, chopped off the cable, and the ship the torpedo went down. That was, that was intended to be one of the first boats for the, the Israeli first boat. Navy. First boat for the Israeli Navy. They paid $80,000 to pay for it. Storm. But you made it, and then you and joined I came the to army. Haifa. When I came to Haifa, I I, uh, I got up the ship. There was a guy standing with a with a rifle and a, and a naval uniform. He looked at me. He said, "Oh my God, what are you doing here? Are you crazy? I want to run away. You come in." <laughs> there was a guy from from DP camp. He knew me. And he was in Israel, he was in the Navy already. And he wanted to get out because he didn't, he didn't want to fight. And I joined the Israeli army in Haifa. I went to, to a place called Fallujah in the Negev. And we caught Abdul Nasser over there, the, the president from Egypt, with the whole army. And after, after being there a year and a half, I went back to Panama. You, one of the things you told me, um, uh, one of those little details that when you were training for the Israeli army, the rifle you used had a uh, swastika on it. Yeah, but all, all Germans, Nazi rifles. Rifles that you were training with. And then... Uh, so you went back to Panama and stayed I went, I, 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 when I got, when I came to, 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 to Israel, I had no documentation. The ship I, from Panama, I've been on the ship without nothing. And, and, and no passport or nothing. But I came in, they didn't ask me for a passport, they didn't ask for papers or anything. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Panamanian consul in, in Haifa and I asked him, could I go back? He said, there's a ship going there, you could go back, I, I, I arrange for you. Mm -hmm. So that's what I went and, back to and Panama. And you stayed for several years? The reason years? I went back to Panama and I couldn't say years uh, is another story. <laughs> when I was in the, in the army, I was a follow. So every once in a while, I go, I, they go to Tel Aviv, you know, I go I hang around with the other guys. And I went to a kiosk to get a, a piece of apple strudel in a, in a soda water. And uh, there was a, every, in Tel Aviv, they have kiosks everywhere they go in the parks. And there was women sitting there talking, talking Yiddish, talking Hebrew. And, and one lady yelled out to the man behind the counter, Mr. Bayer. And I turned around, I thought they were calling me. You called the man behind the counter. The man behind the counter was my uncle. And I never knew I had an uncle. 
I said, your name is Bea? I said, yeah, my name, my, said, my name is Bea too. I said, where you come from? So I told, tell him the story of where I'm from. And, I, and do you remember anybody from home? I said, yeah, I have a, my mother used to tell me a story about a cousin who traveled to Palestine on a motorcycle. He said, he, he's here living in the Brak. So I got that uncle. David, I have, before we close, I, I know you want to share one more thing. And, and my uncle said, my uncle said, what are you going to do here? There's no work, there's no way to sleep. There was there people coming from all over the world. There, 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 there's, no, there's, no, there's, no, there's no work. Go back to Panama, come back later. So I went back to Panama. I know you, before we close, I know you'll want to tell us what happened to Reuben. When I came to Haifa, I went to an absorption center called Teletwinski. And I was already getting, I used to want to go into the army. And I'm passing by uh, uh, tents, military, military tents. And I give a look, somebody waving to me and calling me and looking at me, Ruben. He recognized me, he had a beard already, he was standing there a tent. Oh, doctor, why, how, how, what are you doing? You come here, yeah. What happened to, to you, Ruben? He said, when the Russian came in, they find him in there and they put him in a hospital. He was a, he had a sharp nail and he was all right. And he went to, to an, an illegal ship to Israel. The British caught him, caught the ship and locked him up in Cyprus. In 1948, he came the same time when I came, he came there to, 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 to Israel, and he became, he, he's a rabbi, and he's a teacher, and he has 11, 11, 11 children. <laughs> <coughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna close our program in just a moment. It's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. So I'm gonna turn back to David. I don't know which were the last words that I was here. I have a lot of last words. Which, which, whichever last word you wanna share with us, um, and then when, when, when David's finished, um, please absolutely feel free to come up on stage afterwards and talk with David, you know, shake his hand or ask him a question. He has uh, his, his uh, records from Auschwitz that he'd like to share if anybody's interested. So we invite you to do that when we finish. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Remind you that we'll have a first person program each Wednesday and Thursday through the middle of August. So if you can, please come back. Uh, we'd love to have you and if not, uh, we'll have the program again in 2017. So with that, I'll turn to David. All right, what should I say? Last <laughs> word? I, I only could tell you, the last word is I miss my family very much. A lot of times I, when I'm in my room, I, sometimes I cry. My father was only 42. He was a big, tall man, handsome. My mother was a blonde, beautiful woman. Our sister, nice. My little sister was eight or nine years old. My brother was 12. I had grandfather, they had cousins. After the war, I, I ran around all over Europe and looking. I went to, my, my father had a brother, he used to have a factory of soap in candles in Lublin, in Lublin, Poland, a big city. I had a cousin, my same age as I am, he never made it. I'm the only one for my family. And there were a lot of people. Now I have, my daughter lives in Annapolis, she's a real estate woman. And my son is an engineer, and my grandson is an engineer. My son is a, a paralegal and whatever else he wants to be. Yeah. And they say he likes, like St. Peter's, St. Petersburg, Florida. I said, come home. He said, I like it here. <laughs> he wants me to go there. <laughs> and uh, my wife is an American. She, she uh, is born in New York. The reason, one reason I, I'm here also is because I wanted to be a Jewish. I wanted to, despite for the Nazis, I wanted to have, have a family. Otherwise, I would have married the most beautiful Indian women that are there in the world. In Panama, they have beautiful women. 
and 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 that's what that's what happened to that stomach woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we're glad you came here, and, David. And uh, and now I'm all foggy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Well. And I work here every Wednesday. No, this is not my day. I, I, a lot of times I don't recognize the people who work here because I am only Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I get a lot of phone calls from Canada a lot of phone calls from New York State. Children who were born here and their parents are already dead, calling me to find out about their parents because I, the, the parents come from my hometown and I knew every one of them. So I just got a, uh, a phone call the other day, a woman who was born in 1937 in Poland and I knew her mother and she wants me to tell her about her mother. And I knew her about her mother very well. And I give a lot of documentation. And I had pictures. Also, I recognized pictures. You know, the, muse the, the museum gets a lot of pictures from people who don't know who the people are. You know, the, the Germans killed so many people and, and the pictures, a lot of them burned, but they couldn't burn everything. There's, there's, there's millions of pictures wandering around everywhere else. And every once in a while, somebody finds something and wants to know who this is. And sometimes in the back says Kozhenice. So I give them my name. I give every person, if I remember, everybody, most of them I remember. Hmm. And, I, and I give them the name, and, and a lot of times you find, find a, a way to the family. So that's what I'm doing in the museum. In the, the archives here, photo archives in the museum, have pictures and you don't know who they are. And if, if it's something I, I recognize right away, if I know who they are, I tell them the name and everything. David, you're going to stay with us for a while and answer questions if people have questions of you, right? Stay put there. We'll, we'll invite people to come up on stage. I have, I have time because okay. they'll, they'll right. drive okay. and pick me up. Right. Uh, well, come on. Anybody wants to come and ask David a question, please do. Okay, all right. <laughs>